So narrative, um, if you look it up in the dictionary, is uh, is really it's it's really a benign term, right? It it is the storyline that that links events together. That's what it right. is, right? It's a it's a benign term. It, it's not you know good or bad. It's just storylines that link events together. Um, right. When I think about it in the context of news, I'm generally thinking about it. Um, it usually uh, the idea usually gets triggered when I spot narrative that is um, promoting propaganda, and I think um, the word propaganda um, has kind of a weight to it. It's not used as much as I think it could be because it really does apply mm -hmm. to so many situations. Um, but propaganda is information that's um, that's intentionally presented in a biased or misleading way to get one point of view across, right? Yes. But in order to do that, they're using a narrative, right? Yes. This is out of CIA, eight years out of CIA by this point, right? And and I have distance now. I, I've separated myself from government. So when I'm sitting here in the classroom listening to these junior congressional aides or junior staffers get get taught how to carry out their job effectively. One of the core principles they were taught was this idea of creating and adhering to the predominant narrative. Really? Right? Yes. Yeah. They had, like, it was a huge part of their training for that weekend. Here's how you craft a narrative that fits the constituents' base mm. of the representative that you support. Here's how you adopt the narrative of the staffers above you who have crafted this narrative for the constituent base of the representative they represent, because you can't tell the same story, even though the law is the same, mm -hmm. even though the budget is the same, even though there's facts that go into all the effort that's happening in Congress, mm -hmm. you can't tell District 12 of Alabama the same story that you tell District 18 of Louisiana. Right. And you can't tell them the same story that you tell District 5 in Texas and the same story that you tell District 28 in Florida. Mm -hmm. Even though they're all Republican districts, even though they're all Republican states, they're all different Congress people. So you have to change the narrative. And then, of course, they're, they're also working to make sure that their individual congressperson's narrative flows into the, uh, the caucus that that – uh, that that congressperson belongs to mm -hmm. and into the different like subcommittees. And it's an insane amount of work to craft all the narrative. And it was a very discouraging and depressing experience for me to sit in the audience and be like, none of these people are talking about telling the truth. Right. They're all just finding a way to turn the truth, to turn elements of the truth into a story that wins favor with the voting base of their congressional delegate. Right. And we see that so often. I mean, I think, you know, even when we see the, um, you know, the State of the Union address, they always bring people in and there's, you know, a story because the story helps, you know, bring their narrative together because they're trying to make a point. Um, again, I use the word propaganda. I know it's, I'm sure it's not a, a popular, you know, word to use, but that's really what but it it's is. it's the right word. It's the right word. it's word. the right word to use. Yeah. Um, so, so often, you know, in, uh, you know, and media that has a certain angle to it, um, politicians for sure, because they're running on, on various platforms and, um, you know, they're really running on sound bites because they're trying to get their point. I mean, even when you watch the debates, it's all sound bites. They're trying to get a mm -hmm. point across quickly, a quick hit that resonates with their, with the base that's going to vote them into office. Right. And so, you know, I, I and there, like you know it's it's interesting to watch and I think it's just so important as the viewer as an actual constituent to understand that it's up to you it's your responsibility to fact find and to understand that everything you're hearing is yeah. part of a narrative is part of propaganda they want you to feel a certain way and they're saying things in a way to make you feel that way, but it's really up to you to find the facts. I mean, there might, there very could, well could be factual elements to what they're saying, right? There are factual elements to what they are saying. Correct. But you need to pull all the pieces together to really make an educated decision in the end. Yeah. And you know, it's, I, I feel like this is super interesting and super relevant mm -hmm. because we're getting ready to go into an election year. And yes. 
in an election year, you can rest assured that you're going to be fed a narrative line that connects factual elements, just like you said, yep. into an overarching story that's designed to create both emotional and rational decision making in your mind. So they're taking advantage. I mean, this isn't something nefarious. This is just the standard right. approach to politics. It happens in every country, in every political circle, whether it's authoritarian or whether it's whether it's uh, a monarchy or whether it's democracy, right? Right. There's going to be a narrative, and that narrative is going to be written by pieces of propaganda, mm -hmm. and those pieces of propaganda are are individually created mm -hmm. so that they trigger emotions and the 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 uh, perception of rational thought, mm -hmm. even though it isn't really rational thought, because it's going to be a cognitive bias. They're going to they're going to target your cognitive biases. And they're going to target your emotional reasoning. Yeah. And that's what makes for a really good piece of propaganda. Not that, and again, you're exactly right. Propaganda has this negative connotation to it mm -hmm. because people think it's, it's manipulative. They're right. Yeah. It is manipulative, but it's not something that only bad guys use. Yeah. They're propaganda not just, is something that's yeah. used by school districts. Yeah. It's used by the U.S. military for recruiting purposes. Mm -hmm. It's used by, by politicians for voting purposes, right? Yeah. It's... You can get above all of the fear if you just understand what it is. Mm -hmm. And we've already talked in the, we've talked in the past about how important emotion is mm -hmm. and getting people to feel emotional. Yeah. And that's why you hear the president give an address and talk about the poor six-year-old child who died in Illinois. Yeah. Because he's trying to get you to feel emotion. Yes. And just and every time there's a State of the Union address and he points, you know, the president points to some person in the stands. It's like, oh, here's a police officer who did this amazing thing. And here's a nurse who did this scary thing. And here's a soldier who did this brave thing. They're using emotions to stir us, to get us to, to persuade us mm -hmm. to take a certain action or believe a certain thing. Mm -hmm. But that's all on the emotional side. Uh, I think the really relevant part of propaganda happens on the rational side, the cognitive bias side. Yeah. And, I, you know, we have... Um... We have this product we created some time ago called News Hacker. And the, and the very first lesson we teach is awareness of targeting. So yeah. you have to be aware as an individual that you are being targeted, right? You are somebody's target market, a politician's, a clothing store, a, you know, an energy drink. You are, you are, on a, you are lots of people's target market. And the messages that they're sending are specifically to target you and to target your cognitive biases. So your cognitive biases are, you know, there's a number of cognitive biases and they're all just shortcuts that your brain naturally makes. So it can, um, you know, limit the processing time it has to do when information is coming in, right? So we all have cognitive biases and that's okay. But what's important is to have awareness that those are being triggered. Um, and I think that you know, in reading the news recently, um, whether it's politics or global affairs, I see a lot of cognitive biases um, being triggered in people. And uh, the, th the top three that I kind of noticed the most are um, there's an availability uh, bias, an availability heuristic, where, um, you know, the it's availability heuristic is like the when when something's top of mind. So somebody says something and it's a recent memory for you. You just heard a story about that. So it must be true, right? Like I just heard my neighbor talking about that. That must be true. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, another one is the mere exposure effect. Um, I think in the media, we see that a lot. And I don't think people often put an, you know a lot of emphasis on the fact that what we're being exposed to, right? Because it's not like, I mean, you can go up and you can Google, you know, different news stories, but most people read some kind of news feed or they read a news, right? They're ingesting what's given to them. So right. just by being exposed to something over and over and over again, makes you feel right. like it's correct. It makes you feel like it's the most important, it makes you feel like it's the right. most relevant, right? Like suddenly the only conflict we're hearing about is Israel Hamas, but there are still many other conflicts going on in the world. It's just 
what are we hearing about the most? What are we being exposed to the most, right? That's top of mind. And then the last one is, you know, you and I talk about this one a lot, the confirmation bias, because I think this is the one that people experience the most and don't do nearly enough self-assessment <laughs> to, to recognize that they are falling victim to a confirmation bias.